He mentioned a couple of things as we get ready to dive in. Again, we're not in Acts. So if your Bible naturally opens to Acts, that'll be next week. And I'm going to tell you what, it's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss Acts chapter 3 next week uh, on June the 5th. And we'll continue working our way through the rest of the summer through the book of Acts on Sunday mornings together. It's going to be awesome. Uh, the church on mission. Uh, this morning we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you want to be finding your place in 1 Peter chapter 2, I'll read the verses in just a few moments, verses 9 and 10. We only have two verses today, but they're so rich and so loaded. Uh, we're going to unpack them this morning and encourage ourselves in the Lord. Amen. That's what we're going to do. Many of you ordered the little uh, wooden trays that were going to be made to help the Philadelphia mission team with some uh, expenses. Uh, they are ready today, and Robbie and Jared will be outside the doors uh, to your right uh, as soon as the worship service is over, and you'll be able to pick up, pay for, pick up, if you prepaid, you can pick it up, uh, your tray. So uh, there you go. And they're still doing orders through the 31st, is that right? So that's through Tuesday. You can still actually order a tray. You can go look at them and say, hey, I want one, I want two. But you can order them through uh, Tuesday. Uh, if, if, if you want one today, and you can sell the one we've got, and we'll get one later if you want to do it that way. But any way to help out our mission team as they're trying to earn some money uh, and, and all of that. I know one of our men said his, his tray didn't need handles because his wife could just carry the tray to his bed like this. Uh, I won't tell you which brother that was. I'll protect your innocence. I, I see him out there in the balcony now. But anyway, uh, but he's a funny brother. He is, and we love him. And, uh, and he spoke truth probably. But anyway, the trays will be ready after the worship service today. It's good for you to laugh a little bit. In our community group, we laughed this morning a little bit. I heard the dad, brother Davenport was in there laughing when I walked by one time, too, and I was thinking there, that's good. You know, laughter releases this chemical in your brain that kind of helps you. And in our community group, I, I had said, uh, we're having a baby, and Pam about passed out. <laughs> and I said, no, our community group, group we're birthing a new community group to start later this month for young adults. So if y'all know of any young adults that are not in a community group, if they're engaged or, or, or newly married or, or if they're just young adults, they can be single young adults. That is fine. We're, we're launching a brand new community group uh, later in June. Right now we're all meeting in room 212. That's where 432 meets. Uh, so if you know any, any singles, or any young adults, married, engaged, or whatever, if they, you can invite them to come right now to 212, and later in the month of June, we're gonna birth that new community group and go from there. But Brother Robbie and Brother Billy, uh, Robbie Greer, Billy Brewer, and I will be kind of leading out of this, and we're, it's an experiment, but we're, it's gonna be good for the glory of God. We're looking forward to that. That's coming up next month, and uh, we want to invite you, and if you know some young adults to come, whether they're single or married or engaged, they can come and be a part of that with us uh, this morning. I do want to pray, and then we're going to study God's Word today in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for the gift of laughter. We thank you for joy in Christ. That Lord surpasses laughter. There are moments in life and life is very hard and painful that there can still be that joy and confidence in the Lord even when we may not be smiling. So thank you, Jesus. As we have just sung, Lord, worthy is the Lamb. And we praise you and honor you today. And I pray that you'll help us to hear you today. Through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Growing up, one of the things that I did when I got to be a certain age... I don't even really remember what age it was I started doing this, but I used to get to go and spend the night with a friend. And, and I didn't do that with a lot of different friends growing up, I guess, but uh, I remember a guy by the name of Greg Chandler, and, he, and I would go and spend the night at his house, and, and his house was awesome because they had an upstairs uh, and then a downstairs. Um, they, they, had, they had a split-level house, and they had a basement is what it had. And his mama used to, like, do hair in her basement, all right? She had the beauty parlor in her basement. 
And when we would, when I would go spend the night with Greg Chandler, uh, before I would leave the house, uh, my daddy, J.B. Robertson, would sit me down and he would say, now, now, son, I want you to go have a good time. But you need to remember this. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Now, that put, a, that put a heavy load on a little fella when he was getting ready to go spend the night. Because, you know, spending the night in that big house with that basement down there, and, and we'd play hide-and-seek, and we'd play army, and we'd do all these things that boys used to do when they were, you know, six, seven, eight years old. That's what we did. And the next day, we'd get up and go outside and play in the woods near his house. He had woods near his house. I didn't have them near my house. So his house was super cool because everything's a little different when you go somewhere else. It's just it's stuff you will never eat at home for your parents. You Oh, it is delicious, and you'll just eat it right up when you spend the night somewhere. That just happens all the time. And it still happens even to this day, I'm finding out. But, but my daddy would say, remember who you are. And he said that for a reason. Because, you see, knowing who you are affects the decisions that you make. It affects the way you relate to other people. It, it, it affects the way that you live your life. And the same thing applies to the Christian family. In fact, there's a quote I want to give you by the, uh, the man's name is Andrew Murray. Some of you may have read some books, especially books on prayer by Andrew Murray, a very famous Christian writer. Uh, Andrew Murray said this, The whole Christian life depends on the clear consciousness. You'll see it on the screen. The whole Christian life depends on the clear consciousness of our position in Christ. You see, you and I need to know our identity in Christ, who we are in Jesus. And So let me give you the big idea for this message this morning because this is to be a very encouraging message, and here is the big idea. As the people of God, we are who we are because of who Jesus is. That's the big idea. As the people of God, we are who we are because of who Jesus is. This is a statement about our identity as a Christian, as a Jesus follower. And one of the greatest things that can happen in the life of any believer is when we begin to see ourselves the way that God sees us. Let me say that statement again before I read the scripture. Listen to it carefully. One of the greatest things that can happen in the life of any believer is when we begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. Now, if you look in your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and notice these rich, awesome verses. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter writes, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I want to show you five realities that are true for the people of God this morning. Right out of these two verses. Five realities about the people of God from these two verses this morning. And reality number one is this. The people of God are a people who are loved by God. The people of God are a people who are loved by God. God. Look, look in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter writes, but you, and it's you all, it's a you plural in the Greek language, but you all, all right, so he's speaking to a body of believers here, Jesus followers, but you are a chosen race. That word race simply means people. We're a chosen people. The word chosen means, if you look it up, the word chosen means to select. It, it involves thoughtful and deliberate consideration. That's what that word chosen means. It means to select, to pick. It means it involves thoughtful and deliberate consideration. And here's the thing. You and I are chosen by God as Christians. And let me give you a story to help understand this concept. Because it's a deep one. It is. 
And we can't fully wrap our minds around this concept of we are a chosen race. But let me give you a story that I heard about. A, there's a pastor in North Alabama that told this story. And there was a little fella in his congregation. And he had been adopted by his parents. But he didn't know that yet. And he was at school and some of the adults had found out. And so then some of their children found out. And so what do sometimes children do? They are talking at school and they're saying, hey, your mom and daddy didn't really have you. You are adopted. Well, that upset this little fellow something awesome. He was tore up. Y'all understand that? He was tore up. He was upset. He was so upset. He didn't sign out of school. He ran home from that small town in North Alabama. He ran home from school crying. His mama could not get through to him, and so she called for his daddy to come home from work. His daddy came home from work and couldn't get through to him either. And so what they did was they called their pastor because this little guy loved his pastor. Amen? That's good. And so the pastor was called in, and the pastor came, and he knocked on the door, and he wouldn't let him in either. And he just stood there and prayed a little silent prayer to the Lord, and then he talked to that little fellow for a few minutes. And finally the little guy let him in to his room. And, and he said, he said, you need to understand something. You need to understand that all these other little boys and little girls, parents, when they had their son or daughter born to them, they got stuck with what they got. <laughs> but I want you to know this. Your mom and dad chose you out of all the other boys and girls on the whole planet. Well, that seemed to click in that little fellow's mind. And so he wiped off them tears, and he went running back to that schoolhouse, and he got up in front of his class, and he says, I want to tell y'all something. Your mamas and daddies, when they had you, they got stuck with what they got. But my mama and daddy, they looked all over the whole world and chose me to be their son. And he was a happy little camper. He was a happy little camper. And I want you to understand on the basis of this verse of Holy Scripture, I want you to understand that you and I, those who are believers in Christ, it is by the grace and sovereignty of God that God has chosen us to be His children. We are chosen by God, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9. It, it means that I am loved by God. That's what, when, when you read that, you need to understand the context of this letter. These are brothers and sisters in Christ who are scattered throughout the Roman Empire. They're living in what's present day Turkey over there in the Middle Eastern region of our world. And they were encountering persecution. Peter calls them fiery trials because of their faith. In Jesus Christ. And so he's writing to encourage these men, women, and young people who are walking with Jesus. And he's saying, hey, you have been chosen by God. And that means you're loved by God. I am his and he is mine. God in his sovereign grace has set his heart on me. It's not because of anything that I've done. It's not because I'm lovable. It's not because I've earned it. God in his grace has chosen to love me. And listen to me. God in his grace has chosen to love you too. I want to show you a verse from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. It's from a paraphrase. It's not an exact translation, but it captures the heart of what the Scripture says. It's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 from the message paraphrase. It's by a man by the name of Eugene Peterson. If you have stacks of Bibles already, it doesn't hurt to have the message if you understand it's a paraphrase. It's not a word-for-word -word translation. But listen to this awesome announcement to you and me. Long before he laid down earth's foundation. He had us in his mind. Had settled on us as the focus of his love. To be made whole and holy by his love. Look at that on the screen. Long before he laid down earth's foundations. He had, his, he had us in his mind. Had settled on us as the focus of his love. To be made whole and holy by his his love. Now, why is this so important that we are a chosen race? Because we are loved because of what he did, not because of what we did. Are you tracking with me on this? 
We are loved because of what God has done, not because of what we have done. I didn't earn my way into the love of God, so that means I can't earn my way out of it. Amen? I mean, we're secure in His love. We're saved by God's sovereign grace. Now you say, well, Pastor Jay, I can't wrap my head around that. Well, the Apostle Paul couldn't either. And in Romans chapter 8, listen, Romans chapter 8, verses 35, look at it. Romans chapter 8, verse 35, listen to what Paul said. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword drop down to 37? He answers the question, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Look at verse 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want you to say this with me. Will you say this out loud? I am loved by God. Ready? One, two, three. I am loved by God. Let's say that again. One, two, three. I am loved by God. If you are a Christian in this room, you are loved with an eternal love that, that is from vanishing point to vanishing point. I have loved you with an everlasting love, the Bible says in Jeremiah 33, and there's not one thing you and I can do to make God stop loving us. There's not one thing you and I can do to change the fact that God has set his love on you and me. I love this quote. I didn't give this to the media team, but a guy who pastors in Mississippi, his name is Chip Henderson. He said this, you cannot disappoint an all-knowing God. Are you following me? You cannot disappoint an all-knowing God. He knows everything there is to know about you. And he loves you anyway. Isn't that good? Because every one of us sitting in this room, there are things that have happened in our lives, things we have thought about and focused on and this and that, that we really don't want anybody else knowing about. You may have shared them with your husband. You may have shared them with your wife. But they're just things that, that you did or didn't do. They're, they're situations that arose perhaps 30, 40 years ago, and you just don't want to even have to bring them up. I'm going to tell you what, you're not catching God off guard because he, he's an all-knowing, omniscient God. He knows everything. And the awesome thing is, he loves you and me anyway. Now, some of you are probably getting worried. Well, Pastor Jay, if you tell people that, then they'll just live however they want to live. And you're right. But listen to me. If you have experienced the love that, that we're talking about right here from the Bible, if you've experienced that love, it will change the way you want to live. The Apostle Paul said it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Just listen to these words first. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. Now let's check this out, verse 15, very important. And he died for all, but those who live might, notice it, no longer live for what? themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Are you see that? So we know as Christians we no longer live for ourselves, but rather we live for the one who died and for our sake died and was raised. Amen? And so you see, when, when you meet the love of God the way the Bible describes the love of God, you and I don't stay the same. That's why we say all the time, all the time, no one ever meets Jesus and stays the same. You can't. He meets you where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. You're a more godly husband today. You're a more godly wife today. You're a more godly parents today. You're a more godly grandparents today. You're a more godly workers today because of Jesus at work in and through your life. So reality number one for the people of God, we are a people who are loved by God. Notice number two, reality number two. We're also a people who belong to the kingdom of God. This is going to be good. You thought number one was awesome, and it is. Number two is just as awesome. Check this out. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race. Right? We're people who are loved by God. Number two, you are a royal priesthood. This means that we are a people who belong to the kingdom of God. That word royal 
Y'all see that? Royal. That word royal means belonging to, appointed to, or suitable for a king. Are you listening this morning? Are you listening? The word royal means suitable for a king, belonging to a king, appointed to and by a king. You and I are a part of God's forever kingdom. You see, we belong to the royal family, y'all. We have been adopted into God's family. And everything that belongs to the king now belongs to me. Let, let me read this verse. Ephesians chapter 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Check it out. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians 1.3. God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, I want you to listen to this quote by Dr. John MacArthur. How many of y'all heard of John MacArthur? you read books or heard him on the radio, perhaps? All right, many of you have. He's a fabulous Bible teacher, Dr. John MacArthur. He's pastored one church his entire ministry. Grace Community Church is the name of the church. He has a program on the radio called Grace to You, and many of you probably have heard it. I mean, my Mima introduced me to John MacArthur back in 1979, 1980. She introduced me to Jay Vernon McGee and John MacArthur on the same day. And I've been keeping up with both of those guys ever since around 1980. So it's been a while. But John MacArthur still pastoring that church, even to this day. And he writes this in his commentary on Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. He says this. All that, and you see it on the screen, just so you can have, and I'll read it from the screen. All that the Lord has, those in Christ have. Christ's riches are our riches. His resources are our resources. His righteousness is our righteousness, and His power is our power. His position is our position. Where He is, we are. His privilege is our privilege. What He is, we are. His possession is our possession. What he has, we have. His practice is our practice. What he does, we do. I put in my commentary, that's a great quote, amen? Are y'all with me on this? Y'all still with me after the music stops, are you? All right? I mean, we're talking some wonderful stuff today. God loves you. You just said, I am loved by God, the one who created you in his image. The one who knows all things. And not only that, not only are we a chosen race, we are also a royal priesthood, according to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It's an awesome truth to, to think about and to try to wrap your head around. Everything that belongs to King Jesus now belongs to me. That's what Ephesians 1 3 is saying, and that's what Dr. John MacArthur's quote is trying to communicate as well. You see, we are a royal, but then notice that it says, Priesthood. Y'all see that? That means we have access to the king. You see, a priest would go before God on behalf of the people. He would enter into the presence of God in prayer for the people. That's the Old Testament. And we have access to the presence of the king. Now, in the Old Testament, of course, the, the temple was divided. The tabernacle originally and then the temple was divided into different sections. There was the, the holy place, but then the, the innermost sanctum is called the what? Holy of Holies, right? It's, it's a cube shape. It's called the Holy of Holies. And what separated the, the Holy of Holies from the holy place? What was that? The veil of the temple. That's right. The veil of the temple. That veil was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and four inches thick. They would say that two horses pulling in opposite directions could not tear the veil of the temple in two. It was a huge thing to have to set up when they were moving all the time to the tabernacle. It was it would have been hard work. It was sixty feet high, thirty feet wide, four inches thick. And what does Matthew twenty seven say when Jesus cries out to Philistine in John nineteen? Father, it is paid in full. The Bible says in the account of the crucifixion in Matthew 27 that, that, that the, the veil of the temple was torn in two from what? Top 
to bottom. That shows it's God doing the action. And only God could have torn that veil. And God did. As Jesus died, paying the, the price for our sins, paying our penalty of sin. Listen to me now. But, but then we now have access to God in the person of Christ. In Christ, you and I have instant access to the throne of God. Now, why is that important? Because as a child of God, you have immediate access to God. Hebrews chapter 4. Listen to it. Hebrews chapter 4. Check this out. Verse 16. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Tonight in our service, that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time praying tonight. There's ever been a time in our nation's history and the condition of churches today where we need to just take a little, a few moments of time and pray? It's now. And tonight we're going to apply Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 in our evening service tonight. But we are a people who belong to the kingdom of God. We are a people who are loved by God. I want you to see number three. Number three is this. We are a people who are holy before God. Check out 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Notice the third one. A holy nation. The word nation there means people group. We are a holy people. A holy people group. And here's the question. You know, when you, whenever you talk about holiness, people all the time think, well, I'm not, I'm not holy. I'm not a saint. I'm not a saint. Now, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but I want you to in your heart. Do you know that you are a saint. Now don't raise your hand out here. Raise it in your heart, yes or no. And many of us say, well, Pastor Jay, I, 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 I just know my life. You can ask my wife, she'll tell you. I'm still falling short in a lot of ways. That's not what I'm talking about. <coughs> Listen to me carefully now for a minute. Every Christian struggles. We do. Read Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul himself. The things that I ought not do, I find myself doing. The things that I ought to be eager to do, I find myself not wanting to do them. If the Apostle Paul struggled in, in, in living his life for the glory of God, if Christ in him wrestled with Paul's flesh, don't you think that Christ in you is going to be wrestling with your flesh some along the way? See, Romans 7 tells me and teaches me as a pastor when I meet with people or talk with people and counsel people or answer questions or whatever it may be, minister the word to people, teach the word of God to people, and you say, I got that licked. I don't have a problem with that. Then I begin to suspect you because, you see, if I, if I look at my life and compare it to the word of God, I see this area that needs improvement. I see this that needs to be repented of. I see there is a need of forgiveness from my wife or from my kids or from you. Or from somebody. As I read the Bible, the Bible reads me. And it, it shows I am still failing. I'm still coming up short. Listen to me. I have been saved since I was in the 8th grade. And that's been a long time. And I'm not going to compute how long right now. But I will tell you this. There is nothing in me this moment that pleases God at all. If you understand salvation biblically, you will recognize there is nothing in you at all that pleases the Father except for Christ being in you. Do you all remember that verse in Isaiah 64? I believe it's verse 6. It goes something like this. All of our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. I've been saved. I've been baptized. I've been to seminary twice. I've been pastoring churches of the Lord Jesus Christ, Southern Baptist churches, since January 7, 1990. That's when I became pastor for the first time. January 7, 1990. And there's nothing in me at all in my flesh that pleases the Father in any way. 
It is only the fact that as a follower of Jesus, Christ indwells me and lives in me. When, he, when the Father looks at you as a Christian, he sees Jesus in you, and therefore you're accepted, and you can come to him in prayer. When he sees all you're trying to do as a parent, all you're trying to do as the manager of your office, all you're trying to do as a husband or a wife, or, or as a child, as a teenager, you're trying to live for the glory of God. But it's not you living for the glory of God, it's Christ in you. For apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. And in the flesh, there are times we're going to fail. We're going to falter. and We're going to, we're going to go with the ways of our flesh. But the Spirit convicts us and we, we confess it. We repent of it and we, we get back on the right path. And Christ in you lives His life in you. As you obey mom and dad, that's Christ in you obeying your mom and dad. It's Christ in you shining at work the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. It's Christ in you in the marriage as you're learning how to fold the laundry or you're taking out the trash or you're changing the light bulb or you're emptying the dishwasher and getting ready to go change those three diapers or whatever it may be. It's not you in your own strength. It's Christ in you if we're saved. Now, I want to give you a little statement here that may help. I know it's helped me. Because if I ask the question anywhere on the, on the planet, most folks are going to say, no, I'm not holy. But we don't understand holiness. Holy, check this out. Holy is who we are in Christ. Are you with me? Holy is who we are in Christ and what we are becoming through Christ. All right? Is that, is that compound? I think that's a compound or something. All right? But holy is, is who we are in Christ and what we are becoming through Christ. That is holy. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 1, just across your page, verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Look what Peter says. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The moment you get saved, you're placed in Christ. And so in one sense, you are holy. And in the other sense, as Christ is living his life in and through you, then you are becoming holy. All right? If you halfway get that, say amen. amen. All right? Holy is who you are in Christ. Say amen. amen. And holy is what you are becoming through Christ. Say amen. amen. All right? Now, now, that's the hard part. Because you're saying, I'm married to this woman, and she ain't the holiest woman on the planet. <laughs> and she can turn right back around to you and say, well, old Mr. McGruff, you're not the holiest man on the planet either. And that is true. We're all in process of being made like Christ. Listen, you didn't, you didn't marry Jesus. You married, hopefully, a Christ follower who is indwelt by Christ, who is, as you go through life, become more and more like him. But you didn't marry Jesus when you got married. Jesus is single. He was always single. No matter what Dan Brown says, he was always single throughout his earthly life and ministry. And he died, and was buried, and was ascended back then. We saw that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. But I'm going to tell you what. We are a people who are holy before God. Right now, I am accepted before God. I, I, in one regard, I will never, ever be more holy than I am right now. You know why? You can't add to Christ's perfection, can you? He's perfectly holy, y'all. And in Christ, you that's how God sees you and me. Now, in my daily life... He's working on me. We used to sing that song as children. He's still working on me. It's not bad for 54-year-olds to sing that every now and then. He's still working on me. And thank God that he is. Now, the next thing, number four. All right, are you with me? We are a people who are loved by God. We are a people who belong to the kingdom of God. We are a people who are holy before God. Number, number four, we are a people who were purchased by God. We are a people who were purchased by by God. He says in 1 Peter 2 9 that we're a people for his own possession. That word possession means to acquire for a price. It means to, 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 to purchase, right? That's what it means. We are, a per, we are a people for his own possession, meaning he purchased us. The Bible teaches that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God loved us anyway. God sent Jesus Christ to save us. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ died for our sin. God has accepted his once forever sacrifice for our sins. And we know that because he resurrected Jesus from the dead. Amen. <coughs> 
1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Again, it's right across the page. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Peter says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. We are a people who have been purchased by God. And then number five, we're a people who enjoy the mercy of God. Look in verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Peter says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Millard Erickson, who is a Christian theologian, Millard Erickson has defined God's mercy this way. God's mercy is his tender-hearted, loving compassion for his people. It is his tenderness of heart towards the need. Isn't that a beautiful definition? By Millard Erickson. God's mercy is his tender-hearted, loving compassion for his people. Now stop a minute. If you're a Christian this morning, you can put your own name right in there. God's mercy is his tender-hearted, loving compassion for, and put your name in there, for Jay, for Pam, for Becky, for Robert, for, for Julie, for, for Easton, for, for, you just name the name, for Brother Joe. You just name, put your name right in there. God's mercy is his tender-hearted, loving compassion for his people. It is his tenderness of heart towards the need. You say, wait a minute, I'm not so needy. Yes, you probably haven't been saved if you don't realize how needy you are. You are spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. Apart from God's grace at work in your life, you can't be saved. You are ultimately needy of the mercy and grace of a loving, saving God. And now, listen now, now as children of God, listen, as children of God, we get to experience the tender, loving, God. Listen to me. Every day. I want you to look in Lamentations. Lamentations. Chapter 3. Listen to this. Lamentations chapter 3. I'm going to pick up verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Now listen to that. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It, 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 it never is cut off from you. You need to understand. His, his tenderness is never cut off from you. That's what He promises in His Word. Black ink on white paper. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faith. And beloved brothers and sisters, we need to, God never gets tired of you and me coming to Him and asking Him for help and, and talking to Him. And, and we need to praise Him for who He is and thank Him for the work of grace in our lives. But He never tires of you and me coming to Him. His mercies are new every morning. And so if you are a, if you're a saved man or woman in this auditorium today, let me tell you, you are a people who are loved by God. You are a people who uh, have, have who belong to the kingdom of God. You are a people who are declared holy before God in His holy presence. You are a people who were purchased by God. And you are a people who right now enjoy the mercy of God. And what's the point of that? Look back in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He goes on to say there, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That word proclaim, means, the word proclaim means to make widely known. It means to publish. It means to advertise. Can I, can I Robertsonize that for you a minute? We become, we become a living advertisement of who he is and of all he has done. We become a living advertisement of who he is and of all he has done. Now I want you to hear this big idea at the end and we'll be done. Listen to this. As the people of God, we are who we are because of who Jesus is. 
and who we are in Him shaped how we live. I'm going to tell you, when Christ indwells you, beloved, He's going to change you for the better to be more like Him. You say, well, Pastor Jay, I'm here and I'm not even sure that I'm saved. But let me tell you something. God, through His gospel, calls people out of darkness into His marvelous light. And the gospel is the good news that the just and gracious God of the universe has looked upon hopelessly sinful people. That's all of us. And He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, to bear His blood against our sin and to show His power over sin by resurrecting Jesus' dead body from a grave so that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ can be reconciled to God forever. That word faith, you're saved by grace through faith. And Paul says in Ephesians 2, it's not of your own doing. The grace is not, the faith is He said, that's what Paul says in Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's the gift of God. And this morning as you hear about what God has done in love through Jesus for sinners and, and your heart is stirring within you and you say, I need the forgiveness and grace of God in my life. That's what I need. That's what I need in my relationship with my, my, my boyfriend or girlfriend. That's what I need uh, to be a, a, a person as a worker. That's what I guess. That's what you need. That's what we all need. I mean, the, the answer to the problem of this world is that we all would fall on our knees and say, Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. Have mercy on me. I don't deserve it. I, I can't earn it. You don't love me because I'm lovable, but God, you died for sinners on the cross, and I'm crying out to you to save me. Today. I'm going to tell you, if the world were to pray that prayer, We'd have a completely transformed world. But you know what? The Bible says that day will never come until King Jesus sets his feet back on this planet. And that day is coming. But if you want to be saved, if you want to be right with God, listen to me. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. If you will confess Jesus as Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. For everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no reason today for you to walk out of this place on Memorial Day weekend, right, as we remember the sacrifice Those who gave their lives for your freedom, the one who gave his life for your ultimate freedom from your own sin and self is Jesus. And the cross supersedes any nation's flag. And our ultimate devotion is to him. And I'm going to tell you, he will receive you right now. As immigrants come into our country and they, they go through the process and they apply and they usually wait for years and years and years and they have to study U.S. history and U.S. government. They have to know the Constitution of the United States. They know it better than we do. They have to take an oath to renounce all allegiance to the nation of their birth and to become a sovereign citizen of the United States of America. They have to do that in their oath. And this morning, what I'm telling you is that the King of glory has paid the price for you to be bought and transferred from the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of his marvelous light. The King of glory will transfer you out of darkness and into light. Once you were not God's people, but now you can become God's people if you will call out upon the name of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Would you bow your head with me this morning? And this morning you say, Pastor Jay, I, I'm here and I'm here. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you will.
God, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart today, and you say, Pastor Jay, I really, I want to stop faking the deal. I want to stop pretending to be religious. Stop pretending to be holy. Stop pretending to be a Christian. I just want to be saved. But the Bible again says, for everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. This morning, you can say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness, Lord. Please have mercy on me. If you will pray, talk to God. As he is working in your heart in life. Father, we pray that you would open up hearts and eyes and save people today. We pray, Father, as the gospel is proclaimed in love in this room today, that you would save people, that you would stir hearts and people, that you would, Lord, help men and women recognize who they are as Jesus followers and rejoice in that truth. And celebrate your grace. Your pleasure in us is not based on our performance for you. Your pleasure in us is based on Jesus' performance for us. And today we rest in the cross. We cast the weight of our person and our sin upon him. Just as when we sat in the chair that we're seated in right now. We, we, we just put our weight down right in. We, we believed the chair would do what the chair is supposed to do. Jesus, we believe that you'll do what you say you'll do. And you'll make me new. And you'll forgive me. And you'll adopt me into the Father's family. And I'll have fellowship with God forever. Father, would you work powerfully in our hearts and lives. Save those who need Christ. Lord, those who need believer baptism by immersion. Lord, would you stir their hearts today. And Lord, lead them to come and talk. And we'll prepare for that. Those who may be believers and already baptized and they believe like we believe and they want to come and be a part of this faith family, we pray, God, you stir their hearts and they would come today.